Welcome. President Muhammad Buhari in a nationwide broadcast to Nigerians to mark the 2021 Democracy Day, the president looked at the achievements of the administration as far as the economy is concerned, agricultural sector, infrastructural development, poverty alleviation, the educational sector, with a promise to do more in the area of job creation and the economy. Thank you, Mr. President. Long live Nigeria. Indeed. And we continue to hope for the best. It's been 22 years of Nigeria's journey through democracy. Now, democracy has its dividends and its challenges. What is the Nigerian situation? How has Nigeria fed under the democratic process? That's what we'll be looking at on today's show. My name is Patience Eloi Abba, and this is We Can Deal, coming to you live from the network service of the NTA. Welcome back. After so many years of military rule, Nigeria finally returned to a democratic government on the 29th of May 1999. It's been 22 years of our journey through democracy. But in my interest to know that Nigeria is facing so many challenges, challenges of unemployment, electricity, lack of infrastructural development, challenges in the health sector, and so many other challenges. But I must quickly add that this present administration, the Muhammad Buhari administration, has made giant strides as far as infrastructural development is concerned. But we still have a long way to go. It is not Uhuru yet. Today we'll be doing a sectoral analysis and speaking to policy makers as far as Nigeria sectors are concerned. Our first feature, which is not just a background, that it is put together by Francis Ogbe. It will tell us more and set the tone for our show. Let's see this. On 6 June 2018, eight days after May 29, 2018 had been celebrated as Democracy Day, the President Muhammad Buhari led federal government declared June 12 to be the new Democracy Day. May 29th was a day that uh, the, the democratic government in 1999 was sworn But June 12 was the day the freest and the fairest election was done in the history of Nigeria. That was the day everybody came out, irrespective of tribe, irrespective of religion, came out to vote, and the votes were counted. But the military annulled the election. So it's the day that I think we should celebrate that day and which this administration did the right thing by making it a democracy day. The day provides us an opportunity to reflect on our journey as a nation, our achievements and struggles. It is a day also to honor our founding fathers who toiled to establish our republic and every Nigerian who has worked tirelessly to sustain it. This administration is reconstructing and rebuilding about 440 kilometer road that start from uh, Abuja to Kaduna, Kaduna to Kano. This government is rebuilding uh, the Lagos Ibadan Road, also building Lagos Ibadan Railway, the East West Road. These are major infrastructural projects. The government is also building a rail line coming from uh, Lagos to Ibadan, Ibadan. To, 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 to come down to Abuja, Abuja will link to Kano, up to Niger, Maradi in Niger Republic. In all the six geopolitical zones, there is no place that you will go that they are not reconstructing or rehabilitating the road in that uh, geopolitical zone. As part of the dividend of democracy, 
Government is working towards revamping the cotton, textile and garment sector via the Central Bank of Nigeria's Textile Revival Intervention Fund that will considerably reduce foreign exchange spent on cotton and other textile imports. Also through the Food Security Initiative, the government is promoting grow what we eat and eat what we grow. The economy has been so fragile, especially when the administration came on board. It put some measures like the TSA, like uh, diversifying the economy, uh, uh, bringing out programs in terms of agriculture, the Amco borrowers, the rice farming, the maize farming, a lot of things that uh, the fertilizer initiatives. These are all initiatives that the government formulated so that uh, the economy will be diversified and people, the dependence we have on oil sector. The last 22 years really has seen a lot of progress uh, in the oil and gas industry in Nigeria. Up to 2010, Nigeria's control or local content in the oil and gas industry was just about 5%. Everything in the industry was foreign controlled. but since 2010, with the passage of the Nigerian Content, uh, Nigerian Local Content Act, a lot has happened. Today, Nigeria has 35% local content control. This year's democracy day has come at a time when the whole world is desperately seeking total freedom from the deadly coronavirus, which has altered our lives forever. Health, they say, is wealth. But looking at Nigeria's state of health, can the country be said to be a wealthy nation 22 years after the return of democratic rule? This culture of we traveling to another country to seek for um, health care has not really developed our health care system. Like in Kanu, where I'm coming from, we only have one teaching hospital, which we have a population of over 20 million. I personally brought a bill to create a federal medical center in Kanu so that uh, the ch chunk of the population can also uh, reduce the pressure we have on the teaching hospital. I can tell you, people as far as Bauchi, people from Sokoto, travel down to come to Kanu to seek for medical attention. Uh, so which I'm sure by the time uh, this bill scale uh, and we get uh, these um, bills to be accented and the hospitals are set up, it will go down in uh, alleviating the sufferings of the people in terms of uh, the health care. Continued violent extremism, banditry, farmer header conflict, as well as a revived secessionist movement, among others, have placed a huge demand on the very fabric of Nigeria's existence. Nigeria cannot go it alone in this industry. If it needs to move fast, if it needs to move long, if it needs to move far, it needs to collaborate with other African countries. I know we are the most patient people in the world. We have persevered. Only prayers, hard working, understanding and patience that will solve our problems. Our focus on Weekend Deal today is on 22 years of Nigeria's journey through democracy. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, uh, it is Weekend Deal coming to you live from the network service of the NTA. And we are taking a look at our journey, our journey so far through democracy. We have our first guest in the house, somebody who I'll refer to as a child of democracy, a true breed Democrat. He is the son of Chief MKU Abiola. He himself a Democrat. He is an author. He's a businessman and he's doing so well as far as the Nigerian pro uh, project is concerned. Please join me in welcoming to the studio. Alahaji Jamu Abiola, the Shatima Rashid of Bruno, and like I said, the son of MK Abiola. You're welcome to our studios. Nice to meet you. Yes. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Um, so it is June 12th. Uh, let me start with the basics. How, how do you feel? How did the family feel generally when there was a shift from 29th of May, the celebration from 29th? of May to June 12. What did that mm. mean to you? It meant a lot because, you know, it's like a man that is drowning, then all of a sudden you pull him out of water, you know, 
you know, he will be very happy and he will be breathing and all of that. Uh -huh. You know, we have been trying and hoping that at least, it's already a tragedy what happened, you know, losing my father and my mother. But at the same time, when we were ignored for almost two decades, as if it was like something that we made up or like it wasn't real, then it even made it even worse. So when the government decided to do this, it meant a lot to us. You know, we had fought for it. We had, you know, asked for it several, several times. I wrote a book about the June 12th. I even gave out more than 5,000 copies. I sent to everybody so that they can read and they keep remembering. I mean, I wrote a book before they even made declaration. And we were hoping that this would actually happen. So it was a big relief. Okay. Very, very big relief. Okay. I, I, I do know that it was, it would have been a traumatic experience losing a father and a mother to the Nigerian struggle. Um, as a child of those wonderful Nigerians, how did you feel? What was the experience like for you at that time? You were younger, I want to mm. believe. How did you cope? It was very difficult, but you know, in the Quran, God says that, La you can't fly, nothing illa wusa, that like God will not give you more than you can bear. So I guess the reason why God allowed this to happen to me was because I can actually withstand it. The reason why God allowed this to happen to my siblings was because they could actually withstand it. If we could not, then perhaps it would never have happened. Even recently in the Middle East crisis, huh. some people woke up and they found out that five of their family members were wiped out. So this is something that God can try you with. It's difficult. It's easy for me to say what I'm saying now because it has passed. And my mother, was, she died like almost 25 years ago. So it's easy for me to talk like this. But at that point, I could not. Yes, for people watching who are going through it now, I just need you to tell us how you coped because they are going. They are watching you and say, "This, this is a survivor. This is somebody who has gone through this experience and is out." And like you said, it's easy for you to talk about it now. What are the things you you help, that helped you to cope? Well, what actually helped me to cope was religion. You know, I became more religious, and I you looked at God that created me to also give me the additional strength to go on. It wasn't just even the death. The death is one thing. Later on, there was this court case. Hmm. Then later on, there was talk about how we, okay, we will let you get off the hook if you return money and all these ugly details that made it even worse. So it was like the pain was reopened, 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 you know, over and over again, you know. And of course, previous administrations had decided to ignore you know, the June 12th, and to act as if it never happened. So it was a multiple problem. It's not like somebody just losing his parents. You now hear that somebody is trying to actually use my mother's death to get money back from people. And, you know, he now becomes like she was even being traded, even in her death. You know, they were actually even using her, what happened to her, to trade, you know, and to get money back and, okay, we'll forgive you, without even consulting the children that were even affected by this to even say, oh, oh, she had seven children. It never even crossed the minds of these people. So it was like religion. I used my faith in God to go and to pray to God. And God automatically, not just for me, all my other six siblings, God removed all the pain to the point that at this point now, we're not even bothered whatever happens mm. per se. But if God did not do that, it's the kind of thing that could make somebody run mad. And if you look at what is happening in the country, you start wondering if it's not repercussions for this kind of inhumane treatment. But now, I was going to go there. Today mm. we have too many sectorial agitations from everywhere. What can Nigerians learn vis-a-vis -vis the June, vis -a -vis the June 12 experience? Well, how do, how do, what Nigerians learn from it? Well, what Nigerians have to learn from it is that in life, if you want something, you have to go for it. And you don't just go for it, you go for it all the way. You know, the problem with us in this country is that we like to be spectators. We like to watch and we just look as if something doesn't concern us. When my father won the election, he was given a mandate by the people of this country. So when he came out and he declared himself as president, he did that based on the mandate he was given. And when my mother now saw that he was on his own and like pretty much people have gone on with their lives, she came out and she was fighting and fighting and that's why she got killed. So at the end of the day, if more of us had participated in that process, it would have been difficult for just one woman to be singled out and killed. Or like, so people should always know that this issue is a collective issue. So we have to start thinking that 
anything we do is collective. It's collect we're all in it's, it together. We're all in it together. They should not look at it like it was a personal struggle of MQ Abiola for his mandate. Because that transition that took place for all those years cost Nigerians billions and billions of naira. And at that time, the exchange rate was very favorable. So if such monies were even put in agriculture and so many other things, by now we'll not have all these bandits and all of that. But this money was a transition that was for Nigerians. So when this thing happened, they should have seen it as a collective you know, problem that they have to fight collectively to resolve, number one. And up to now, you know, people will say government is not working, government is not working. What are you doing? You know, it's not just about voting. You have to participate in the system positively. You cannot just expect that you have voted and they're going to work miracles. How many people are in the government? Maybe people in government are not more than two or 3,000 all over the country. And Nigerians are 200 million. So how do you expect 2,000 people to solve the problem of 200 million without the participation of those other 190-something million people? They have to be more participatory. They can't just sit in the sidelines. So I urge Nigerians to do whatever they can do, to go out there in terms of positively, actively contributing. Not just criticize government. Also come up with alternative ideas. Okay. And if government does something right, encourage them, motivate them. Don't just look at, oh, this plan is not working, this is not working. What are you doing for your country? We have to like look inwards so that we can, you know, get something at least get to where we want to get to. Okay. So look inward we must. And now as a family how are you keeping the legacy of your father alive? Even mm. with your parents, I must say. It's very difficult to keep the legacy of a man like my father and a woman like my mother because I'm now 45 years old. My mother, she was 44 when she died. And look, she has a street in New York named after her. Something like that, to actually keep the legacy of someone like that, it's very difficult. These are people that are greater than great as far as I'm concerned. So what we can do is to just try to not put on their shoes but put on they're sleepers at least. So my sister, Hafsat, she formed the Kudrat Initiative for Democracy more than 20-something years ago, and she has been trying her best to empower women to be more actively involved in politics. And I recently, in view of the agitations and all the problems in the country, I formed another organization called the Kudrat Abiola Sabangari Peace Foundation mm. because my mother was born in Sabangari, Zaria. I went there, I met the people there, and I saw that Zaria is a model of what I think Nigeria could be in terms of like the peaceful ethnic coexistence in Zaria. So I'm trying to like, you know, get involved. We have a technical committee. We're going to help government to come up with alternative solutions to some of the problems that it's right. facing and give proposals. So I think everybody should go ahead and not just my father's legacy, also the legacy of people like, you know, the um, Ahmad Bello, people like, you know, Abafemi Awolo. We have to, like, you know, really, really work towards ourselves to improve the legacies of all these people so that we can start seeing some results and not just put all our hopes on government or leave all the burden for government to carry. Okay. Mm. So let's uh, move in a, way, a bit away. Uh, a lot of people, uh, commentators are saying that we mm. should go back to the two party system like we had in the past, the mm. SDP and NRC. Um, mm. What do you think? The two-party system better than the multi-party system? What is your take? Well, the two-party system is easier to monitor and it's easier. Like in the United States now, you know, they have, you know, Democrats, they have Republicans. But the problem is that democracy, you cannot just throw out people's ideas. Not everybody's going to agree with such an idea. So as long as we just have parties forming ideology and people should actually f join each other to form a party because of their ideological belief, it shouldn't be a question of, I'm going to join this party because I want to become a senator. Hmm. Or I want to join this party because I want to become a governor. We have to like just, not just even, we can't reduce the number of the parties because they've come to stay. It's going to be difficult to just wipe them out. But let's try to get some of these politicians more involved in an ideological background. That way, when they form policies, there's more consistency. And everybody knows and can predict what the government is going to be by the ruling party. There should be more ideology in politics. That's okay. what I think we should look at. Okay, so it's um, if we, if we, what you're saying in essence is that if we have mm -hmm. a politics of ideology, mm -hmm. we will be able to actually achieve something as mm -hmm. far as our political life is concerned. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, your last words to Nigeria. We're celebrating uh, Democracy Day today. What do you have to say to Nigeria, even as we wrap up? Well, what I would like to say to Nigeria is that 
the struggle continues. When I say struggle this time, and we're not talking about a struggle against any system, the struggle against ourselves to make ourselves better. You know, we shouldn't make the same mistake we made during June 12 when we laid back and we allowed, you know, people to do what they did. At the end of the day, we were still paying the price for that because these people stayed in government and they looted the government and the money that were supposed to be here to develop Nigeria ended up abroad. And that is why we have all these bandits and all these terrible people. We should also understand, as the president said today, that the two driving factors against insecurity is poverty and youth unemployment and all of that you know are products of looting and corruption so we have to be more active positively so that we can actually get the best out of democracy and not just sit down and watch as if we are watching a movie because this is our lives and what happens is going to have a direct you know, impact on what happens to us on a daily basis Thank you so much, Aladi mm. Jamio. Indeed, like you said, we are all in it together and mm. we must all put hands on deck. Thank you for coming mm. to our program this morning. Thank we you. truly appreciate you. Right. Okay, we'll be moving on quickly. It's been six years of President Muhammad Buhari's administration and Suleiman Babaji will be taking us down the line. Let's see how far that goes. Carnaby has been described as monocultural, that is, depending on a single commodity, oil. Expectedly, when the sector sneezes, the economy catches cold. A narrative President Muhammadu Buhari seek to change from when he was sworn in as the sixth democratically elected president of Nigeria. The economy was more or less in a mess. The economy had lost more than 4% over a four-quarter period. The administration, among other measures taken to improve the economy, was the constitution of Economic Recovery and Growth Plan. The plan emphasized that by 2020, Nigeria would have made significant progress towards achieving structural economic changes with a more diversified and inclusive economy. Real GDP projected to grow by 4.6% on average over the planned period from the estimated contraction of 1.54% recorded in 2016, reaching 7% at the end of the planned period while inflation rate is projected to trend downwards to a single digit by 2020. You have a government that for the first time is making good its promise to diversify the economic base of the country. I think even from that perspective alone, we need to give it to the government. Um, the results may not uh, be coming too quickly as uh, we would have loved to. There had been a deliberate policy of credit creation by the CBN, you know, through the banks, to MS, MSNEs. You know, more than three trillion naira new credits had been created for this, for this sector, which, which is impressive. Once we are able to do that, it would, of course, drive production and productivity. And that is also showing in, in the recent figures that we have now and the values of our GDP. Our GDP fell to a low of 404 billion in 2016. We are now talking of about 514 billion now. That's, that's a quantum leap. Diverse opinions greeted the implementation of land border closure as some were critical of the policy which they say resulted in decline in earnings from non-oil exports. They say the policy decision reversed the few gains made in the last couple of years and further exacerbated the challenges facing the economy. In addition to sharp and consecutive increase in prices, inflation rate rose from 11% in August 2019 to 14.9% in November 2020. The economy also recorded consecutive trade deficit since the fourth quarter of 2019, many non-oil exports that serviced neighboring countries suffered losses. Uh, the primary reason for the closure was to increase the capacity of Nigerians' entrepreneurs to produce in us, and also to increase the hunger of Nigerians to consume locally produced uh, goods, you know, that is one. Then two, to discipline our neighbors who had created an economic template that is officially parasitic. The act of smuggling was an industry, you know, in those jurisdictions. And the smuggling had to do with smuggling into Nigeria and again, 
taken out of Nigeria illegally, products like our like our petrol. The moment we 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 get our acts right and we're able to harness these potentials to their fullest, uh, you will be looking at the possibility of being net uh, uh, producer of some of this um, a produce where, where we have competitive advantage. The country has the potential to be a net, a net exporter of rice. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, Nigeria's unemployment rate increased to 33.3% in fourth quarter of 2020 from 27.1% in second quarter of 2020. COVID-19 certainly had a lot to do with these figures and government responded with several intervention programs to keep MSMEs afloat. Nigeria exited a second recession in four years after MBS reported that Nigeria posted a real GDP growth, growth rate of 0.11% for the fourth quarter of 2022 following two consecutive quarters of contraction. The breakdown showed that agriculture, trade, telecommunication and information services and real estate all contributed significantly to the GDP. Emphasis for productivity is moved now you know, to non-oil sector. So we are, we are being weaned off. It is not that we are weaned off totally, but we are being weaned off you know, our dependency on oil. So uh, the, the other activities in the economy that are not known uh, oil related are also moving up. As citizens, we also have roles to play in order to make the country work. One, we must be able to cage our lust for foreign uh, foreign goods. The fact is, this country is sitting on a gold mine. We have um, abundance potentials in uh, different sectors of the economy. The government is faring well in terms of uh, providing the incentive and the enabling environment for us to be able to appreciate the potentials of the country. We must ensure that there is no evidence of democracy that we can give to the people more than the security. If we anticipate security, it will provide food on the table, it will provide health care delivery, it will provide access to transportation, no matter how incompetent it is. But when you have no security, you are pushing people more to the poverty and hunger is, uh, is likely to be the outcome. Nigeria has improved its ranking on the latest World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index but experts believe that the significant headroom that exists in energy, security and trade policies must be addressed to achieve the sustainable growth of the economy. If you're just joining us, it is Weekend Deal coming to you live from the network service of the NTA. We've been taking a look at our journey through democracy. It is 22 years. And now, joining the conversation is Malam Gabashehu, the Senior Special Assistant Media and Publicity to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari. Sir, you're welcome to our studios. Thank you, Patience. Thank you. <laughs> so, okay, so let me start. Uh, what is the significance of the change of date from May 29th to June 12th? Well, uh, there is a sense that uh, May 29th was just there, something artificial. Uh, June 12th, on the other hand, is judged by Nigerians, the international community, that uh, it, it gave us the finest hour in, in our democracy. It was adjudged that election, which unfortunately was annulled, was adjudged as the gold standard in all democracies. And so therefore, if we are celebrating democracy and the victory of Aviola, yeah. which itself marked the victory of the Nigerian nation, and the nationhood above all divisive sentiments. So that's where to go. So mm -hmm. June 12 signifies the best for this country in our democracy. And the president said, well, so why don't you go for the real thing? That's the gold standard. So that's the choice. Okay, moving on, uh, Nigerians and our friends all over the world are celebrating six years of the president uh, uh, president being in power, is there a reason for us to actually roll out the drum? Do you think we should be celebrating? Oh, sure, because uh, <laughs> look, uh, democracy evolves as a self-correcting process. The problem 
in the early years of the country, uh, before this uh, republic, yes. was that uh, democracy was never really allowed to take hold okay. um, through periodic elections. And, uh, and so therefore, we never really got to practice this as well as we should. Here we are. We have uh, come a long way from then, from 1999, 1999 to now. We have witnessed peaceful handover of power, not only within politic a given political party, but from one political party to another. So with each day we gain, it tells you that then democracy has taken root by the choice of Nigerians that this is our chosen system of government. A lot of people, again, we argue that um, it is, let's say, 22 years, starting from the very beginning of democracy in Nigeria, but we are still battling with the same issue. Power, the health sector, uh, educational sector, and some other problems. So why are we still, what's your take on this? Well, uh, certainly it is uh, less to do with the system of government than the kind with the kind the more with the kind of leadership that this country has had. The president has said all the time he had looked at the enormous resources available to the country over a long period of time. Oil, for instance, being the chief earner of our foreign earnings. And and he the question he keeps asking where did all the money go to? Because if this country had invested in these elements, infrastructure, early on, we would not have ended up with the deficit that we are now dealing with. The president has realized that we have come short in the area of infrastructure, infrastructure being a basic requirement for economic, for national development. Without it, industry cannot grow. Social life will not be ideal. And so therefore, it is then the reason why Nigerians should appreciate the emphasis that President Muhammadu Buhari continues to place on provision of infra infrastructure. Sometimes even we are having to borrow money doing the railways, the roads, improving power water supply, health, and the education. Yes, so the concern is justified. We should have done, we should have settled these issues of infrastructure much earlier than now. But attention was not paid to them, and this is why we're having to do this crash program. And unfortunately, the president, well-meaning as he is, trying to get these things in place, were also confronted with the vicissitudes confronting the economy, low oil prices, um, COVID, you know, all of these attacks on the economy. So earnings are not as much as they were in the past, and the challenges are bigger than what we ought to be confronting. Okay. But moving forward, how do you think we can deal with some of these challenges? What can we do as a nation? Well, the thing is that... Uh, uh, we continue to do what we are doing now. You know, the president just um, some days ago, you know, commissioned the Lagos uh, Ibadan Rail Link, for instance. He had completed Kaduna, Abuja, and next week, uh, next month, we are hoping that uh, Abuja, Aikano, Kaduna will. So, all of these things, we just have to, it is very, very painstaking. Mm -hmm. we, we have uh, choices to make. We can put all of the money we earn into the pockets of people, pay salaries to civil servants and allowances, and enjoy good life and not do infrastructure. The country will continue to lie, and, and countries of lesser potential will come and overtake us, as we have seen, I've seen it over, over, over the years. Okay. So we just have to commit ourselves to resolve the issue of infrastructure. Because once that is in place, everything will fall into 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 line okay. mm -hmm. so um, you're the spokesman of the president how will you describe mr president he's much uh, mis misunderstood because um, the president is uh, 
is a very calm person. Uh, quite unlike many people, he's not rattled by threats and, and, and attempts to intimidate or bully him. You have seen such attempts being made. And, uh, and the past leaders, some of them, because they were rattled, you know, they, 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 their hands were shook and they took uh, wrong decisions, which uh, you don't expect. Maybe on account of the fact that President Muhammad Buhari was there as a military head of state, and uh, in military regimes, all of the power is consolidated, executive, legislative, and judicial, in one power. One, one, one. So that perhaps explains uh, you know, part of it. But the thing is that he is calm, he's composed, he's not rushed. And so therefore, he's not liable to make mistakes as most other people will be making. He's not, he is also very firm and very strong. Many people think because he's not there, you know, up there in front, you know, before TV and talking all the time, they mistake aloofness as, as a, a sign of weakness. And I keep telling people, they dare not chance the president. Because people who have done that, they have realized at their own peril that they have mistaken. He is fully conscious and aware of the environment, and he knows where he's going. Interesting. What do I expect from this administration two years to go? What legacy would this ad administration leave when it is all done? Well, first of all, there is the destruction. I would call it a destruction facing the nation and the administration by insecurity. Uh, it is real. We are not uh, thinking that it is not there. The losses of life, banditry, kidnapping, and all of that. The president is determined this will be resolved. By the time he finishes, this country will be calm, will be peaceful. And then uh, be sure that you are going to have landmark infrastructure in, his, in, in place. Whether they will give him the credits immediately or it is later that it will come, this president must be remembered for the good work he's doing with the roads all across the country, bridges, power, water resources, the railway, and the airports, and, and the seaports as well. So by the time people look at it and say, wow, could one man have achieved all of these things within so short a time? But President Buhari will deliver. The security is one legacy that, if it's left, would forever, forever remain a legacy for all of us. Um, you know, I will let you go without talking about the Twitter ban. What is your take on it? Say something about it. Nigerians are watching and they want to know. I think that um, <laughs> saved me this question. Nigerians are watching. They'll say, ah, the whole media man is here. He's not talking about it. <laughs> no. It is a sacrifice we all have to make because um, it is the nation that is at stake. So all of us as Nigerians, we have our choices to make. We either stand up for the nation, defend its interests, its integrity, or we'll submit to intellectual slavery uh, or recolonization of sorts. So the Minister of Information is on it, he's handling it, and uh, we are hoping that at the end of it all, everyone will be happy. Without Happiness is what we pray for, and we know that at the end of the day, Nigerians will be happy by God's grace. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome. It was just a pleasure having you here. We've been speaking with uh, the senior special assistant to uh, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, senior assistant on media and publicity, Marlam Gaba Sheikh. The conversation has been about Nigeria, our democracy, and the journey so far. We go on a short break. When we come back, we can deal, we continue.
welcome back. Let's quickly go over to Oyo State where we'll be taking a look at the dividends of democracy. The emergence of democratic rule in Nigeria over two decades ago certainly remains a watershed in the history of the most populous black nation. Interestingly, that historical moment not only offered renewed hope but also great expectations for the people of Oyo State and Nigeria at large. Definitely, uh, the high hopes that came in 1999, came with 1999, has not been fully realized. In fact, it has not been realized to, to, to an extent that Nigeria will say thank you to the politicians. I, I think we, the politicians need to be told that uh, they have rather seized the opportunity provided by democratic rule to feather their own nest and manipulate society in a manner that is contrary to the expectation of democracy. Otherwise, the, some of them have shown light of what is possible. Because if you look around, yes, the infrastructure development is not as expected, but we can turn to, point to areas where achievements have been recorded. 22 years down the line, not more than five chief executives have taken turn to pilot the affairs of Oyo State with promises to leave the state better than they met it. Engineer Olushe Imakinde is the fifth and current governor of the Paysetter State. He took over from the late Senator Abiola Jimobi, who was the longest serving Democratic governor in the history of Oyo State, having served two terms of eight years. On assumption of office, he promised to redefine good governance with focus on people-centered policies. To affect the majority of citizens, people in power must use state funds to make life easier for the citizens. And this is what we have been doing. As a roadmap for accelerated development in the state, the administration is focusing on four key areas which include economy, education, health and security, not leaving out other sectors. Monia Ijai Isain Road, which was once a death trap, is a major road linking Ibado with Okyogun and many other parts of the state. The road, crucial to socio-economic development of the state, is just one out of many other roads projects in different parts of the state that has received major intervention by the current administration. We understood the economic significance of this road, not only to individual residents, but also to the growth of commerce and industry. The money I die sharing road is the link between Ibadan and Okyogun. A your state food basket. This road also hosts the West Moribond Paysetta Quarry and Asphalt Plant. Not only have we resuscitated the plant, but it is already producing asphalt that we use in building of our roads here in your state. To restore the glory of education in the state, the government equally took steps to recruit more teaching and non-teaching staff remodeling of infrastructure in schools, regular distribution of exercise books, and many other projects. But look at Lautec. It was able to secure Lautec for the people of Oyo State. And uh, to some extent, there was this reduction in their school fees recently, 25%. Let's give it to him. He has tried within that two years. The two years in office of Governor Olushe Imakinde in Oyo State has also brought about development in other key sectors of the economy, including health, agriculture, among others. We have 351 wards across 33 local governments in Oyo State, close to 251 primary health centers are under renovations. Uh, each government, they have, uh, they, they've tried to move us a niche uh, better than where we were, but in terms of expectations, I think there's a lot that, that still can be done. And I will admonish the, the current government to use this opportunity of the anniversary of democracy to reflect on what it has done so far and uh, devise new means to fast track what it still has to do. We've experienced 22 years now of experimental democracy. We have seen the things that are not working 
and we are addressing those issues. And it's very patriotic to address those issues. Like Oliver Tuis, there's still a long way to go in terms of growth and development of all the key sectors of the economy as the nation Nigeria progresses in our democratic system of government. Again, welcome back from your state. Let's uh, take a look at our health sector and see how well they are faring. This report is put together by Thelma Obaze. Recommended funds for the health sector, if you want some good improvement, should be at least 15% of your budget. We've never gotten beyond 5%. You see that the infrastructure will be obsolete. Uh, you discover that the human resource gap has always been an issue. These gaps that have resulted in decay of the infrastructure, resulted in uh, very few human resources available to meet the growing population. Even a few health workers available will seek greener pastures. The demand is so high and they depend mostly on government facilities. You go to some of the hospitals, you don't get anything you want to get there. Uh, people are working there as if uh, they are not being empowered or they are not being trained. Uh, because, you know, when you compare the services you get from the government hospitals and that of the private hospital, you, decide, you discover that the private hospitals are more trained than the government hospital. Health-wise, they are trying. And you know our population as well, the medical facilities that are around, the population have overstressed it. The government is doing its best to see how we can improve on our own health facilities. We've had a lot of issues with maternal mortality. We had a lot of issues with infant mortality, uh, under five mortality, our immunization rates have uh, not been the best. Our health insurance coverage is uh, still requires a lot of work to, so that we can have more people in the pool of the insurance and more funds available to provide health care, especially for the underprivileged. That will improve on our coverages. It will positively impact on the services provided. We've been taking uh, some of our patients to the hospital, so we've been seeing how some of the doctors, are, I mean some nurses are doing, you know, of which you, we, uh, we sometimes we just get annoyed and we take our patient to another hospital. Uh, the doctors and nurses, I can see, they are not fairly treated and it has affected their services to the masses. Because it is when someone is satisfied before the person can render good services. Most of our hospitals now, uh, we have been able to improve the services we provide by the mere fact that uh, we have uh, very highly skilled health professionals in the FCT providing services in our public health facilities and uh, many of the private health facilities in the FCT compared to what used to be the case a few years ago, you know, 10 years back, you could count the number of, uh, of uh, consultants providing specialized care in the FCT. What we need to do is that to improve on this number, we need many more, as well as to make sure that the equipment they are working with are also uh, modern and up to date. For emergency cases, there should be provision, irrespective of maybe, or especially accident, irrespective of, oh, you have somebody or not. There should be drugs, there should be cards, there should be people to attend to, do, to, to emergency cases. If the government or individuals responsible in this sector can actually increase their remuneration and other welfare packages, it can actually go a long way. A lot of efforts have gone into COVID. And these have rubbed off on the health sector positively. Many more health facilities have many more modern equipment. Many health workers have received uh, more skills. Many have been uh, exposed to more knowledge. You know, this era of uh, virtual trainings, providing improved facilities to go beyond COVID so that it is sustained. 
we should be able to open up more regional area uh, centers of expertise, excellence, okay, so that people have more access to health, modern healthcare facilities. Okay, the world will be celebrating um, World Blood Donors Day on the 14th of June this year. And uh, as a pre-event uh, to that very important day, we have two guests in the house. There will be three more light on this very special day. I have um, uh, two guests in the house. The first one, I'll start with the lady because it's ladies first. And the first one is Barrister Kemi Olomola Sijua Day, MNI, Director Emmanuel Abiodun Olomola Foundation. Madam, you're welcome to Weekend Studio. And Thank then you. we have uh, Dr. Omo Eze Domoe, Head Operational Center, NBTS, with the National Blood Transfusion Service. Uh, doctor, you're welcome. To Thank Weekend you very Studio. much, Madam. Okay. All right. Let's start. What's the theme of this year's celebration, Doctor? That's for you. Okay. Um, the World Blood Dinner Day is set aside on June 14th to celebrate those um, unsung heroes who go out to donate blood um, freely, unpaid donors, um, donation to uh, those who need it and those who they may ne never know. So this year's theme is um, tagged, um, and give blood and keep the world beating. Okay. It's just to celebrate the young, um, raise awareness of the contributions of the young people, how the, their contributions of this gift of life continues to uh, ensure that the world is beaten. Okay. A lot of people die from accident, childbirth, anemia, and what's up. What's, uh, so these um, gifts that people give, these blood um, um, donations. donations, actually helps the world to continue to beat. Oh, indeed, that's yeah. very interesting. That's key to our existence. Oh, nice to come. I see that you're partnering with them. Why is this partnering? Why are you partnering with them? Why is the foundation partnering with the organization. Okay, thank you very much. I'll speak a bit about the foundation itself. The name of the foundation is the Emmanuel Abiodun Olomola Foundation. It was set up in the memory of my father, Emmanuel Abiodun Olomola, who died in an accident uh, some 30 something years ago. Of course, I was a child at the time, uh, so to keep his memory alive, we set up the foundation. Uh, one of the objectives of the foundation is to help children deal with emotional trauma of losing their parents, which we went th uh, through at the time. Of course, we know in this part of the world, uh, many a times children are not being paid attention to because we assume they are not grieving. Uh, so we are paying attention to that particular aspect okay. oh. of uh, children's grieving from a loss of a family member. Okay. So why are we partnering with um, MBTS uh, for me, it's more about creating awareness that we could save life. Yes, we, we, there's, uh, some, I think we usually say prevention is better than cure. What we are doing is an aftermath of the event, but this can be prevented as well. Uh -huh. So if someone keeps donating and the person doesn't die in the first place, uh -huh. we probably won't have to deal with the emotional stress. Uh -huh. So we are partnering with them to create that awareness uh, that if we are able to donate and keep the parents alive, Probably the children will have to go through I, the stress. I, I see event. how I, I see the synergy. Yeah. It's real and it's emotional. Okay, doctor, um, do Nigerians donate blood? And if Nigerians, I'm going to ask you two questions back to back. Are Nigerians donating blood? And if Nigerians are donating blood uh, for free, like we said before, the cabaret's rule, why do we sell blood in hospital? And what is the process? Can you just answer all this together? Okay, um, I would say um, the, to the first question, yes, Nigerians donate blood. Um, uh, when they are informed about it. Uh, we still have a huge gap in terms of uh, how much Nigerians know about voluntary unpaid blood donation. Okay. And that's the role of the media to uh, enlighten Nigerians about that. I'm really pleased that the NTA has taken this upon, upon um, this to, to share light on this, uh, shed light on this. Um, the more information that is put out there, the more Nigerians are sensitized into donating blood. Before the program, remember what I was talking about that um, to the gentleman, uh, that whether you donate blood or not, after 120 days, the, your red blood cells will die. So oh, why not say use that it? again. I want to hear that. Okay. I need to hear that. Yeah. Whether you donate blood or not, 
after about 120 days, the red blood cells will eventually be destroyed by the body and die off. They get old and die. Their lifespan is about 120 days. So wouldn't it be better to donate it to save somebody's life rather than allow it to be destroyed? So Nigerians don't know that. Most Nigerians don't know that. So when the blood service partners with the okay. National Television Authority, we, people get to know that. Yeah. And so that's why we can't uh, undermine or underplay the role of the media in public enlightenment on this thing. Okay. Now, to the other question about um, why is it that we, people sell blood, okay. the correction there, ma'am, okay. is that um, blood cannot be sold. Okay. You can't put a monetary value on blood. On blood. Okay. You know, so um, oftentimes you ask, why is it that uh, there's high access charge okay. to to blood, to the blood that people are freely given to the? Now, if you look at the from the collection to the to receiving okay. blood, okay. what we call vein to vein, from the vein of the donor okay. to the vein of the recipient. Okay. There are costs associated okay. with it. Okay. The bagging, the screening, screening. And which is most important. Okay. The so reagents you use to screen oh. okay. the unit of blood oh. are bought in dollars. They're okay. not manufactured in Nigeria. So okay. you can see, imagine. So basically, the, from the yeah. collection to where to it is given to somebody, there's a lot of cost involved. Cost involved. So in, I think in, that yeah, makes and, a lot of sense. Including transportation. Transportation, okay. Yeah. So quickly, um, what is going to happen this year? What is your contribution to this year's celebration? Your foundation, just briefly as we round up. Okay, what the foundation is doing is to cre join MBTS to create the awareness. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a blood drive at Jabi, blood, uh, Jabi Children's Park. Okay. When we leave this place, we are heading there. Okay. So to see um, if we can get people together okay. to donate blood. Okay, good. Uh, can awesome. women donate blood? A lot of people ask questions. Can we women donate blood? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. I need to answer that. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> we have come to the end of our show and really appreciate you for staying with us. Thank you.